God Amen. Amen. excited. God is going to speak. Let's go to Exodus 34 and we'll start from there. Exodus 34. From verse 29. Exodus 34. Exodus 34, verse 29 to 35. We'll uh, read <clears throat> this from the Old Testament and uh, another one from the New Testament. Uh, we'll read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 after this. Now it was so when Moses came down from Mount Sinai and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the children of Israel came near, and he gave them as commandments all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out, and he would come out and speak to the children of Israel whatever he had been commanded. And whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Mm. So what we read here is when Moses went to the mountain to speak to God, he received the two tablets hmm, upon which the Ten Commandments were written, and he brought down to the people who were waiting for him under the mountain. And when he came down, his face was shining. And he didn't know. And the people of Israel, the leaders of Israel, and his brother, his own elder brother, Aaron himself, terrified to see him and fled away from him. And when he realized that his face was shining, he had to cover his face. So, they, so that he could talk to them. Mm -hmm. And from that time onwards, whenever he goes back to the mountain to talk to God, he took off the veil. And whenever he came down from the mountain to, to, mm -hmm. to, to talk to the people, he was covering his face. They could not stand in the presence of the glory shining on his face. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul took this story... And he talked about it in the New Testament. And let's see how the Holy Spirit interprets this story in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 to 18. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Mm. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is weighed, a veil lies on their heart. Mm. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, mm. the veil is taken away. Hallelujah. Mm. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, mm. there yes. is liberty. Freedom. But we all, with unveiled face, 
beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When the Holy Spirit interprets that story that happened in Exodus 34, the Holy Spirit spoke through Paul. There is another veil, the veil inside the heart and the mind of the people of God. Come on. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. So Moses' veil on his face was a symbolical representation of the veil in the heart of the people of God. That prevented them to see God, to know God. And that veil... Paul says, is it still there even now in my time, in Paul's time? He talked about what happened 1,600 years ago in the time of Moses. He said, there was a veil in their heart, in their mind, in their mind, which prevented them, hindered them from knowing God, from seeing God. And that same veil is still here now in the mind and the heart of the people, even though the people go to the temple to worship, even though they read the scriptures. The people of Israel were called to be a priestly nation. Exodus chapter 19 tells us, God called them to be a priestly nation. All of them. All of them. Priests for God among the dark world. But they failed to be the priestly nation. Each of them failed to be what God called them to be. Because, because being priests requires to know God. They cannot declare the God that they, that they don't know. It required them to need to know God. But something prevented them from knowing God. The veil, the callousness in their heart. I would like to take you to Isaiah chapter 1. Verse probably 1 to 3. Let's read from 2 to 3. In this poem, God, through his prophet Isaiah, speaks the charge that he has against his people. He's charging them. He's accusing them. God is accusing them. This is an indictment of Almighty God against his people. In the Jewish culture, when someone is charged, you need to have two witnesses. You need to have two witnesses to testify the fact. And God here calls heaven and earth as his witnesses. Heaven and earth as his two witnesses and he indicts or charges or accuses the people of God. From verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey its master's creed, but Israel does not know. What does it, what, what does it, what does it, it what does it, it know, not know? He doesn't, Israel doesn't know his make, his maker, its maker. But Israel does not know. My people do not consider. And it goes on. I have done this. I have provided this. I gave them this. But my people fail to know me. Israel failed to know God. This is my charge against the people. Look, he says, even the ox knows his owner. Yes. <laughs> the donkey knows its creed. But my people... Um, uh, becoming here worse than ox, worse than a donkey. They fail to know me, whom I nourish them, 
their father, their mother, their creator, they failed to know me. Imagine, he called them to be his priestly nations. Each of them were called to be priests. And it required to know God. But they failed to know him. And Paul tells us it's because of the callousness, the veil inside of their heart. And he says, what terrifies me, that veil is still here in the people of God. Even though they read the scriptures, even though they go to church. Going to church, <coughs> reading the scripture by itself, cannot be knowing God. It's possible for the people of God to do everything what is done in church and still remain dark still fail to know God. That's right. <laughs> Why? Because of veil in the heart. And thank God, God has provided for that veil to be removed from our heart. Paul says, that veil is removed when we turn to the Lord. Yes. To the Lord Jesus. Jesus is a veil remover. Every time we come to him, the veil, the callousness in our heart, in our mind is removed. So the call is, the Holy Spirit's call is for the people of God to continuously turn to the Lord. Amen. Turning to the Lord is not a one moment event. It's a processional, continuous, regimented process towards to the Lord. It's a journey towards the Lord. Turning to the Lord is moving closer and closer every day. A continuous, intentional movement to God, to the Lord. And our turning to Him, our continuous journey to Him, removes the hindrance in our heart. And today, as a pastor, my call is people of God. Let's continuously come to the Lord. Let's be intentional in our Christian journey. Mm. Don't assume that the Christian fellowship coming to church, reading the scripture is what God is require, uh, required of us. No, we need the heart has to come to the Lord. It is possible for people to do all these rituals and remain estranged from God. A stranger, dark in their heart, not knowing God. So God is calling the heart. Come to me. Continuously come to me. And that is not easy. I'll tell you, the people of Israel in the wilderness, they represent us. They are saved. They are saved from the world. They are the people of God. God dwells among them. They were Saved from the power of Pharaoh and Egypt in one day. So the sacrificial lamb on the Passover, that day on the 14th of the first month of the Hebrews, the Aviv months, they slaughtered the lamb and sprinkled the blood on their doorposts. And when the angel of death came, he passed their houses. They were saved that night. They left Egypt and went to the wilderness, crossed the Red Sea. They were like us, redeemed from the world and from the power of darkness. They, we are saved by that Passover lamb. Paul says, our Passover Christ has been sacrificed for us. Jesus is our Passover. We are saved. The, but the people of Israel, they were saved from Pharaoh and Egypt in one day. But it took whole 40 years to take out Egypt out uh, from their heart. 40 years. And even at the end of 40 years, most of them died. They were unable to cross over to the promised land. So the, the people of Israel in the wilderness are just like us now. They left Egypt, they were saved from Egypt, but they have not entered the promised land. They were in this between situation. They were saved from Egypt, but they have not entered the promised land. 
the 40 years wilderness journey in theological language, it's called already not yet. Already not yet. What does it mean? They are already saved from Egypt, but not yet in the promised land. We are in that wilderness situation. We are already not yet. We are already saved from the power of darkness, but not yet in the promised land, in heaven. That will come when Christ comes or we go to him. In this state of already not yet, it's a life of wilderness. What does what do we find in the wilderness? There is war. You remember the people of Israel? They were fighting against so many nations. There was thirst. There was hunger. There was a struggle. There were uh, plagues. There were war. All these things God was using to polish them, to, to smoothen their heart so that their heart becomes soft and they know God. God say, when he told Moses to build the Ark of the Covenant, he told him to make the Ark of the Covenant from what kind of tree? You remember that? From Acacia tree. Why? Of all trees in the world, Acacia is the most useless tree. Do you know Acacia? Have you seen of Acacia tree? It doesn't grow here. Isn't it, it grows, rare? Huh? Isn't it very rare tree? No, in, 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 in Africa, in uh, Middle Eastern countries, that's a plenty. That's oh, like okay. uh, probably the maple tree here. Oh, okay, okay. It doesn't grow here. It's, it's a desert tree. Oh. Acacia is the most crooked, twisted, <laughs> thorny, useless tree. You cannot make anything out of it. <clears throat> the only purpose it has is a coal, the firewood. That's a firewood in all Africa. That's a firewood in the, in the Middle East for many, many, many years, even until now. They pro make coal out of it. But you cannot make any furniture out of it because it's twisted. And there were other trees in Israel when God said, Make me the Ark of the Covenant from Acacia tree. Impossible. The most twisted, the most ragged, the most even ugly and thorny wood. Mm. Mm. He said, polish that wood, make a tablet out of it, <coughs> huh? and make a box, mm -hmm. and my word, the Ten Commandments, will Jesus. be hosted there, and it will be plated by coal. Mm -hmm. That acacia tree, is you and me, our heart, our Jesus. hearts. Yeah. The people of Israel, the most difficult people on the face of the earth are the people of Israel. Mm. They saw the miracles, the hand of God moving with them, doing miracles. Mm. No other nation has ever seen. Mm. God literally descending down and, and being present among themselves, leading them with a fire of pillar, with a pillar of fire and cloud, the mountain shaking and burning in their face in front of them when he came down, he divided the seas, he gave them food, in the desert meat, he gave them meat, he rained down manna from heaven, all the miracles that no other nation has ever seen, they saw the hand of God, but they failed to know him. They are always complaining and murmuring. And God says, in their heart, they returned to Egypt. They became like a twisted bow of an arrow, arrow. A crooked arrow. A crooked, twisted arrow. It doesn't go where you aim it. <laughs> That's what happened. So God is... Telling them, this is you. I am making this. I am I'm smoothing this thing. The acacia tree. Which no carpenter would do. And I'm going to put my word there. Because God's plan was that the heart of the people of God becomes so soft. That he will 
write his law on their hearts. Amen. He didn't want to give them a law written on the stone tablet. He mm. wanted to write his law. Mm. So their heart was so rugged, it looked like the acacia tree. But Moses made that uh, ark from acacia tree. His mother did. His mother, and it was plated with gold. It became so precious, yeah. and it, in it, the word of God is housed. That's what he wanted. And us, this fallen state, this fallen nature, is so rugged, so cracked. It takes a whole lifetime to polish it. And that is what God doing in our lives. So the circumstances and challenges that we face in life, through the pains and the struggles and the shortages and the lack, whatever we're passing through, I want to tell you that the, that is the hand of God smoothening out the acacia tree. Mm. So that He will write His word on that heart. God. So that the heart will be gold plated. So that it will house the presence of God, the word of God. The callousness of in a heart is a formidable war. Mm -hmm. yes. A formidable war. When Jesus died, we know that the veil of the temple torn apart mm -hmm. from top to bottom. Not the other way around. Not from bottom mm -hmm. to top. Because to show that there was no human hand involved. Mm -hmm. If it was from the bottom, somebody just tore it this way. Mm -hmm. But it was high up of yeah. no man's reach. It was God that tore it apart from top to bottom. It was cut. And Josephus, the historian of the first century, tells us the thickness of the temple curtain was nine centimeters. Oh, wow. no human can cut that. This was handmade, nine centimeter thick, heavy curtain. We have never seen a nine centimeter thick curtain. That's how thick it was. But God tore it apart. And we are ushered into his presence. That veil represented the sin that we inherit from Adam and nature. When Adam and Eve fell, humanity was estranged from God. Through the work of Jesus Christ, that veil is cut. Now there is another veil in everyone's heart. That curtain can be removed. That veil can be removed only when we are willing. And we come to the Lord. Lord, I want to know you. Imagine. I just want, to, want you to imagine this God. You know, we take him so for granted because we always talk about God and we fail to figure out what that God is. Imagine an infinite small indescribable almighty God who created the universe. Mm -hmm. This vast universe and billions and zillions of galaxies that we cannot even know. And each of them having countless stars. Most of them are bigger than the earth we live in. The diameter of the universe nobody can calculate. It's beyond our imagination. Mm -hmm. yes. And the inner space and outer space and all these are speculations for man up to now. He created them all in one word. Let it be. Mm -hmm. What kind of God is that? Powerful. What kind of awesome God? When, imagine this God, He chose you. He chose to be your Father. Yes, God. He created you. He chose to be your Father. He chose to have a personal relationship. A day-to-day -day one. And he said, I am for you. Yes. Don't worry. Do not fear. I am your provider. I want you to know me. Don't you think then, the sole purpose of life for each and every one of us, 
should be to know this God. Amen. Mm. Yes. Should it not be our reason to live, our passion, desire to know Him, to come closer to Him? Knowing God and worshiping Him is the ultimate quest of life. Yes. The Westminster uh, Catechism. Catechism is the basic doctrine, a basic doctrine of of Christianity, what we believe in. And in in the I think 17th century or 16th century, I'm not sure. They wrote these basic, basic tenets of our faith in a question and answer form. Number one says, what is the chief end of man? What is the chief end, the chief pursuit, the chief purpose of you and me to live? And it gives the answer. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen. To glorify God. That's the purpose, the main purpose of our life. Mm -hmm. If our life is not geared toward this, this purpose, mm -hmm. We are off track somewhere. Mm -hmm. That should be the main pursuit of our life. To know this God. To glorify God. To enjoy Him forever. And the main hindrance is the veil inside of our heart. What is that veil? Can I know it? What is that veil that is in me that hinders me to know God? You know, man has three natures. Spirit, soul, and body. The spirit man in us is the child of God. God is a spirit. When we believed in Him, when we are born again, that child, that new person in us is born. And it's in the, that child is created in the image and likeness of God, who is a spirit. So the spirit looks God. It's the heart and nature. It's the image and likeness of God. The spirit man is inside of us, all of us. It's a a newly born child. When God refers to us, my child, he's referring to that spirit man who looks like him. Mm -hmm. We have another one which we call soul, our natural being. The soul has three things in it. The mind, intellect, the emotion, the feeling, and also the will, our will, it has three things. And we have, of course, body that we see. Now, the soul is our self, our ego. This personality, mm -hmm. it's our personality. Right? The soul is our personality. That's where the veil lies. Come on now. When God speaks, He speaks to the spirit man inside. Jesus. The spirit man is unable to hear Him or to see Him because the personality this, the, within the soul, our mind, mm. our will, emotion. our emotion come in between. Yes. <clears throat> Preacher, <clears throat> hallelujah. That is what has to be brought every day to the Lord because when we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. Says Paul, I would, I, would, I would like to read it again for you. In 2 Corinthians, 
When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. You remember? Moses was going to, to the mountain. The, he takes off the veil. Comes down to the people. He covers the face. He was, the Holy Spirit is telling us something. There is a veil in everyone. That veil can only be removed when we turn to the Lord. The word personality, it comes from the Latin word persona. Persona means, I'll tell you now, persona means a mask. How did it came? In the Greek or Roman world, the Greek culture, even though but the Romans controlled the world militarily, the Greek culture was still dominant. So in every Roman square or amphitheater, a drama, a theater was played, and Greeks were the, the actors, because they were so high advanced in, in, in arts, uh, in, in, in philosophy, in arts, still their art, their culture was dominant. So the, uh, this is how they used to do it. For example, two actors play in amphitheater representing ten characters. How they do it? They use different masks. So, for example, they have a mask like a king, and the actors are trained to, to voice the, 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 the voice of the different characters. So the, the person speaks like a king. And he wants to speak like a lady. He has another mask which looks like a lady. And they speak exactly like a lady. And if he wants to speak like a child, he takes another mask of a child and he, takes, uh, he speaks like a child. They do it perfectly. And so the, the, the spectators, in their imagination, they see the different characters. Because they are completely, perfectly uh, displayed. That mask is called persona from which we get personality. Now we all have that mask now. We play different roles in society. We are fathers, we are husbands, we are brothers, we are children, or when we go to office we are managers. So what do we do in life? We play this persona, these masks always. But where is me? Who is me in these, all these, I, I play different masks when I live in society. And these masks, these personas, society gave it to me. Culture gave it to me. I was told through the school system, through living in society, this is the right way of behavior and this is wrong. And all our society and our culture is estranged from God. This is, this is far away from God. So this culture, this education builds me up. My soul, my personality, in such a way that I am far away from God. I play these roles, these personas, to live amicably with society. But this same persona, this personality, hinders my inner being, the spirit man, from hearing God, from knowing God. So what is the struggle now? The Christian struggle. I have to continuously bring this persona, this personality that is created by society that's far away from God, who has so many layers of veils inside of it, to the cross. Mm. I have to bring it to the cross every day. So my Christian journey is a day-to-day Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Presentation of this nature, this fallen nature, into the cross. Mm -hmm. Present uh, your bodies. What does the Romans 12 one say? Mm -hmm. As a living sacrifice. That's what it means. I present. Look, if the people were in the Old Testament were bringing a sacrifice, a lamb to the priest to sacrifice. But now, take yourself as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice, unlike the Old Testament. A living sacrifice. Bring it to the cross. Amen. Always. Because that's the hindrance, that's the veil. 
The veil has to be removed so the inner man, the spirit man, hears God. Jesus. And Paul says, Galatians 2.20, what does he say? I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but I Christ that is living in me. Amen. 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 Jesus, Jesus. These people are the ones for whom the veil is removed. That's why they saw the glory. He went to the third heaven. And he writes to the people of Colossians. In Colossians, uh, Colossians 3.3. 3. To the church of Colossae. He writes. You died. You died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Imagine that he's writing it. I'm writing a, a letter and I tell you, you died. <laughs> That's what Paul is doing. You died. <laughs> How did they, did they die? God hid your lives in Christ and put it on the cross. Yes. That day Christ died 2,000 years ago. Biniam died. Amen. I want to tell you, Biniam, you are dead. You have died 2,000 years ago. Right. Just you have died 2,000 years ago. The life that I live now, yes. says Paul. Thank you, the, life, the life that I live now, it's by the faith of the Son of God. Love. Who loved me and who gave himself up for me. Yes. You died for yourself. The life that you live is you are assuming to be Christ here on earth. You are living his life. Your life is crucified. Die! So now this happens in the spiritual sense. It, 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 it didn't happen in the physical. It happens in the spiritual realm. So I walk my day-to-day -day life with the acknowledgement that a babu has died 2,000 years ago. The life that I live now is the life I live by faith in the Son of God. Amen. Amen. That person uh, of me, which has layers and layers of veils, which hinders me to know God, has been crucified. So I take myself every day to the cross to acknowledge that that old man has died. Amen. And the new creation is living. Amen. Yes. Yes. And the God speaks. To the inner man. What is so important? Mm -hmm. The people of Israel were called to be priests, which requires a personal knowledge of God, Amen. a personal fellowship with God day to day. They failed. And now God chose us, the New Testament Christians, to be a priestly nation, all of us priests. Mm -hmm. How does it happen? We bring ourselves to the cross Amen. every day. Yes, Amen. For the persona to be, done, to be crucified to the cross. Paul says, oh, I'll take you back to that 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Chapter 3, around verse 16, let me read it. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Amen. Now the Lord is spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Yes. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding yes. as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. What he's saying? We now, when the veil is removed from the heart, when the body is presented to, as a living sacrifice every day, when the persona is removed, when the persona is not blocking God, when the spirit man in me communicates with the Father, spirit to spirit, what is happening? I will behold yeah. His glory. Amen. Amen. I will Hallelujah. behold His glory. Oh, this is a message from someone who saw the glory of God, taken up to heaven and saw the glory of God, because the veil was removed and he saw the glory. So he is telling us, when the persona is removed from you, you will be able to see the glory of God. 
We call this church glory and power. It's not the glory and power of the church. The church doesn't have any glory. The glory of this church is the Lord himself. So when we say glory and power, it's the glory and the power of the church of God to be manifested among us. We have the right to see that glory and power. If this church is going to see the glory and power of God, it requires on each of us to day to day come to the cross, remove that curtain, that veil in the personal and release the spirit man inside of us to hear God, to see him. Sin has no place. We cannot think of the glory and power of God when there is sin being entertained. That's far away removed. Represent yourself as us. A holy, Amen. a holy and living sacrifice. Holiness has to reign in the church. Amen. Everyone, one, one purpose in life, Corporate. to know, to glorify, Amen. Thank you. to enjoy Him forever. Jesus. When that is the sole purpose of your life, you, have, you are in track. You got you the purpose of your life. So, oh, it doesn't end there. Seeing the glory, that's not the end. He he says, Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul says, we see the glory, but it doesn't end there. I myself will be transformed into that image and the glory is revealed in me. Glory and power. May the Holy Spirit stir your spirit. Amen. Stir your heart and mind. Yes. yes. Let's be f- few people, but few people adamant, focused to live for the Lord, to glorify God, to day to day, to day come to the cross. Yes. Remove the veil, because whenever we turn to the Lord, the veil is removed. Amen. Amen. Yes. The veil is removed. Amen. The veil is removed. Wow. And we see the glory Jeez. and we get transformed. Mm-hmm. Let me say a side example. This happened. This happened. They saw the glory. Uh, the, they saw the glory and they also were transformed into that image. Second Peter chapter 1. Second Peter chapter 1 from 16 to 18. Peter is telling how he saw the glory. He is part of these few people who saw the glory. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice. Which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Mm. We saw, we heard the glory coming from heaven. Peter, John, and Peter, uh, James. They saw the glory because the veil is removed. When the veil is removed from the heart, you will be able to see the glory of God. Mm-hmm. We'll be able to see the glory of God. Oh, another one went even farther than them. You know who? Stephen, the martyr. Mm-hmm. 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 In Acts 7.55, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God mm-hmm. and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. While this was happening in Acts 6.15, he said, And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, at Stephen, saw his face as a face of an angel. The mm. mm. heavens were open. He saw the glory of God. He didn't know it. He was being transformed into that image. And they look at him, he looks like an angel. Mm. But because the heart was callous, they still killed him. That is the New Testament reality. Hmm. It's not only for the leader, Moses, everyone is ushered into this glory, Mm -hmm. to see the glory, to transform into the glory, so that people see the glory of God in our lives. 
Oh, Holy Spirit. This will not happen by proclamation. This will not happen by anything I decree from the pulpit. Mm. This is a desire in the Amen. heart of the people of God Amen. to consecrate their lives every day, to come, to, to desire to know Him, yeah. to have fellowship with Him, that there will not be any hindrance between them and Him. And our glory will manifest. Let's... Tell each other Thank you. as we go to Angus from next week. Yeah. We are called to radiate the glory of God to the area. Mm -hmm. wow. The theme of this year is manifest glory. Amen. Don't forget. Mm -hmm. The glory is going to manifest mm -hmm. through us and in us. Mm -hmm. And it requires few people who walk in holiness and righteousness, in the fear of the Lord, sacrificing their personal, their personality Amen. every day. The personality is hindrance. Do not say, oh, this is me, I can't help it. No, you can't help it. Take it to the cross. When you turn to the Lord, that hindrance will be removed. Amen. You are that child inside of you, the spirit man, whom God calls my child. He mm -hmm. wants that child to come out, mm -hmm. to rule, to dominate, mm -hmm. to shine. Yeah. May God help us. Amen. Thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, for this word. Yes, Lord. Thank you for calling us to be holy and righteous people, Lord. Thank you for calling us to turn to the Lord every day. That nothing will distract us. Nothing that happens around us, around the world, will distract us from focusing and following in you, Lord. We bring this fallen nature to the cross and the veil in it, Holy Spirit. May you guide and help us remove the veil for the spirit in us will be released to declare your goodness. Let the outside world, the dark world, see the glory in us. Let this church serve you. Let it be a light, a lamp, Lord, to the, to the darkness, O oh God. Let it be the beacon of light yes, that you yes. say it is. God. Let this message encourage everyone whose ear is in the span of hearing my voice. Holy Spirit, stir their heart and mind. Yes, Give them the grace to follow you one step closer to your God. Thank you, Father, for the time you give us. May this word be imprinted in our heart. Yes. And walk in it, O oh God. Yes. And help each other, sharpen each other, hold hands with each other. Yes. And may we be a living sacrifice yes. to you, O oh God, in whom you are well pleased. Yes. Reveal yourself among us. Yes, Lord. Let your glory and power manifest among us, Lord, so that the dying world will We'll see it and, and be <clears throat> saved. Give us the anointing. Give us the grace. Yes, Jesus. To speak the truth in boldness, O oh Lord. Bind us together yes. in the spirit of love yes. and commitment, O oh God. For focusing on the great thing. The great thing is you, not us. You among us, O oh God. Let each and every one of us, God, be determined to honor you, to serve you. As long as we live in this flesh, O oh God, let's redouble our efforts of serving you, O oh God, and serving your people, O oh God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, our Redeemer and Savior, Lord Jesus. Glory be to you forever and ever. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen.